morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace. Uh, thrilled you could join us here online. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Um, a few announcements before we jump into the, the message this morning. We're starting a new series, so I'm uh, excited about that. First is if you're giving, uh, you can do that online uh, through the website, igrace.ca uh, slash giving. Uh, otherwise, you can e-transfer if you like, or if you'd like to join us on Sunday, we'd love to see you here. Uh, you can give in person uh, through the machine here. As well, uh, if you're visiting, you've been watching a little bit online, uh, tracking along, we'd love to connect with you and just to, to get to know you, invite you out here, f figure out if there's a way that we can uh, integrate you in a small group. If you're a local, uh, we'd love for you to do that. You can do that on the website. There's a link right at the top for a connect card. And uh, so we'd love to uh, reach out to you and send you a little gift too as well, an e-gift uh, to Starbucks, if you want a $5 uh, gift card, we'd love to send you just a thank you for uh, checking us out. So appreciate it and um, hope you get a chance to do that, igrace.ca. Uh, no other big announcements for the new year. We are uh, just uh, starting off new small group. So if you're part of a small group, I'm sure it's kicking back off again after the Christmas break. And uh, if you're interested in getting uh, involved in a small group, we'd love to hear more about it. And last bit of business is this is the first morning uh, that our Guelph crew is kicking off uh, their, their services. It's a soft launch. Official launch will be start of February. But if you are interested, you're in Guelph maybe, you're watching or Guelph's closer to you. Um, wanted to let you know about that starting off 10 a.m. Uh, Sunday mornings. And there'll be a link uh, uh, by next week on our website showing all this stuff about where you can find the Guelph uh, Church. And uh, it's a satellite service, and usually they're doing lunch afterwards, so you might get yourself invited out if you go. Uh, we'd love to have you and love to connect uh, with you if you're more local to Guelph. Well, let's just take a moment and pray, and we'll ask God to meet us. So, Lord, we bow our knee to you this morning, Jesus. We thank you for the new work and, the, and the, the new beginnings, Lord, and the new connections and the new vision and dream, Lord, that you, you've put in our hearts. And we ask you, God, to, to let it grow up, Lord. And it, it grows, Lord, as we're attentive and as we're obedient and as we're open to your word. And so I pray, Father, as we hear your word this morning, as we consider your thoughts, as we consider your ways and your wisdom, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would move in their midst, Lord. Move in our midst together. And uh, God, let us be open uh, to what you're speaking. Let us be uh, faithful to be obedient to respond. In your name, God, bless your people. Amen. Well, it's a new year. And just as we did last year, I wanted to embark on this new season by taking the next three weeks to remind us, or maybe for the first time for you, to, to t explain to you three key values that we hold here at Grace as a family of God on mission together in the world. These three values are important because values, values in general are important because they help inform the way that we think. They inform the way that we, we act, act and practice. They inform the way we think about God, inform the way we think about our own lives, our identities, about our community, and about our purpose. So values are, are really matter. And if you're asking this morning, where did these three values come from? I think it might be helpful for me to explain that to you. See, almost five years ago, as I was sitting, uh, sitting in the you know, middle of an afternoon at a conference, I was listening to someone speak, thinking about the things we were talking about. I heard God whisper three single words to me, like a ticker tape across my mind's eye. And those three words have, 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 that God gave me have reshaped I, my life, challenged my way of thinking about things, and really have evolved to become a path of wisdom that I found led me into deeper life with God, deeper freedom with God, deeper reality with God. And if you're like me, and you were to imagine someone, say yourself, receiving three life-changing words from God. Wow, that shaped your whole direction. Imagine that. You wouldn't be wrong to anticipate that moment as some sort of, you know, earth-shaking spiritual experience. 
If, if God's going to give you three words that change your life, that you imagine that's definitely the case. You probably just sat right down and or, you know, you had to, you know, you got knocked off your feet. And maybe you've even had moments like that in your life where God has really just, you know, impressed something upon you or overwhelmed you. But the, this moment that I'm talking about, those three words, it wasn't like that at all. In fact, if I could compare it to anything, that moment, at all, if I could compare it, that moment would be like the planting of a seed. Now, if you've ever planted a seed, you know it's not a moment with any real fireworks. It's just the beginning. There's nothing instantaneous or elevated about the moment of planting a seed in the ground. You, 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 you dig a hole, you pop in a seed, and then you cover it up. And then you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And, I mean, if you're a child, you're just as likely to impatiently dig up the seed the next day to see if anything's actually happening yet. And I think that's the case with all of us. We, we want something to happen, and yet a seed takes time. But that's, that's what it was really like for me as I mulled over those words in my heart, not just for a few days, or a few weeks, but for a few years, and really these last five years. And they, they're still growing inside me. And these seeds have, have grown in time into something substantial and, and also something fruitful for me. And the three words that God spoke to me are, of course, if you've maybe seen the title here online, is sm slow, small, and simple. Slow, small, and simple. And as we look into the horizon of a new year, I want us to think about those words as a seed for our, for our lives and for this year. And it's fitting because there's nothing fast, big, or complicated about a seed, is there? Seeds instead epitomize to us the best of what it means to be slow and small and simple because they grow and they take on something beautiful. And they bloom and they're fruitful. And so that's what I'm asking God to plant in our hearts today is this, the wisdom of these words. And I've come to realize that God wanted to give me those words, you know, as a kind of a, a double entendre in seed form. He didn't want to blast them at me. He just wanted to plant them like a seed. And he gave me the word slow and as I, 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 we've, we've unpacked this last year, so you can actually go back and, and, and listen online to last year's uh, run-through of slow and small and simple. But I'll just summarize. He gave us slow as an antidote at the soul level for the toxic hurry that we find ourselves caught in. He gives us small as a word to guard our minds, to keep us from being enslaved to a life of striving. And he gives us the word simple as a heart remedy to the frantic urge to always have to chase more or chase better. I can't count, in fact, how many times through these last few years that God has used these words to pull me back from the ledge of worry. It's all right, it's just slower than you thought. To, to lift me out of the pit of despair. Don't worry, these small things will grow. Or to keep my feet on the narrow road. Don't worry. One simple step after another. And I've come to realize that these words are, are part of God's grace to me and hopefully to us. That they carry within them, the seed, in seed form, that foolish wisdom of God that offends our human pride. That they carry all the wisdom or they carry the wisdom of the coming kingdom that if you let God plant in your soul, will grow and establish things that cannot be shaken. So I want to take some time this morning to talk specifically about the slowness first of a seed, the slowness of it, and to think about the speed at which a seed grows and how that might be a word for us today. I want us to consider that together. It's a simple thought, but consider how slow a seed grows. But before we do, let's just take a moment. I want us to ask God to open our hearts to this. So God, we know that seeds need soil. 
And so we ask, God, that you would, you would open up our hearts to receive. Lord, you, you, you'd, you'd find our hearts this morning uh, good soil for your word. And we ask, God, that what you speak to us today, Lord, that you'd connect things for us, that you'd, you'd convict us, Lord, that you'd uh, refresh us with the truth of who you are and how you work. And I pray, Lord, there would be just a, the freedom of the Spirit upon us to enter into, to repent around these thoughts. Lord, to understand the slowness and the mercy and the wonder of God. So let me explain just a little bit about our culture first. See, I don't think it's, mo it's hard for most of us to see that our world, this world we live in, the city that we, that we find ourselves in, we, we see this world hopelessly addicted to hurry. Not just, not just fast, but in a rush, overmatched. It's true. We, we almost never slow down. And when we do, it's simply to just rest for the, next, for the next day. If you ask someone how they're doing, they always say, I'm good, but I'm busy. We're, we're constantly distracted, stressed out, and behind. And it's apparent to me as well that our culture is also intoxicated with personal achievement, self-actualization, and, and power. No matter what you hear someone say about power, people pursue and value power. And so we learn early on to despise not just slow things, but small things and small beginnings. Accordingly, We've had, to we've, we've had to internalize just by living in this world that bigger is better. We just all mostly believe that because we're all trying to prove that we're worthy to justify ourselves to others, to people that matter, and of course, to ourselves. And if, God forbid, something is small, we, 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 we imagine it better have big value. We, we want the big things. And of course, then we're also plagued by the other deadly virus that's at work in our culture, which is that we never feel like we ever have enough. We never, we're never satisfied, always distractedly taking on more and taking in more. And in that kind of world, the idea of simplicity is never really enough for us. And into that world, so into that world of hurry and striving and never enough, this world we live in, we're all in, infected by it in various ways. Into that place, not just, not just in, out there, but into our world, as, we're, as, we, as we struggle with these things, Jesus arrives like a breath of fresh air, and he tells us about an entirely different kind of life. A new way of living, Jesus comes and says. There, there is. There's a new kind of life, and he says it's a good life that you can have instead of the life that you're living. Jesus comes, and we, we know if, you, you know if you've been around church, or you would have heard these things. If you're weary, Jesus has what you need. If you're disappointed, Jesus can help. If you're angry, or you're lost, or you feel like you're living on empty, you're in the right place. And the gospel and, and, and the scriptures and, and, and our, our church our churches and our, we say these things and it, you, we repeat them, we declare them, we sing them. And, and if you're like me, when you hear that and you realize it's God speaking, what do we say? We say, well, Lord, I am, I am tired and empty and yes, I do need you. And so we say, yeah, Lord, bring it on. I want it all. We get into this place and we say, yes, in fact, God, I don't want just a single portion. I want a double portion, Lord. I want more. I want you to do all of it. I want you to take everything. And, and as we're, you know, wholeheartedly and, and honestly saying that to God, I want the rest you have. I want the grace. I want the breakthrough. I want the, the, the mercy. I want the, 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 the vision and the purpose. I want, you know, we want all these things. And Jesus, as he hears us, he's so excited. And I want you to picture this. Jesus is smiling and he's laughing as he, he reaches into his, you know, into his bag and he, and, he, and he says, of course, I'll give it to you. And he gives us a seed. And then we say, but Lord, I, I want all of it. And so he says, okay, I'll give you more. And he gives us 
hundreds of seeds. He pours out seeds. He blesses us, heaps of them. And as he does that, you look at Jesus and then you look at the seeds that he's giving you and you, you try and encourage him. You know, you say, well, Lord, you know, uh, you know, I don't really need a seed right now. Maybe he didn't understand what I meant. You know, I don't need a seed right now. I, I, need, I need the tree. I want the tree. I want the fruit, Lord. I want the shade, the harvest. I want the breakthrough. And Jesus is like confused in that moment saying, yeah, well, that's what I just gave you. And more than you need, actually. I gave you enough that there's, there's, there's so much in, that, in those seeds that it's enough for, for you and your family and your whole community. And that's what's so interesting. Whenever you and I perceive and consider a seed, we realize, and maybe even now you're realizing, that because of their small size and their slow speed and their, and their, their apparent simplicity, we realize that we are all perfectly positioned in our culture to underestimate their power. Don't we? Nothing special about a seed. They're cheap. You can buy them for cents. It's probably the only thing you can get for under a dollar is some seeds. And we overlook them. We're perfectly positioned to overlook them, to even treat them with contempt if they were to be offered to us, not realizing what we've been given. In fact, the, the previous owner of my, of my, previous two owners of my house made that very mistake. They, they underestimated the power of a seed. This is a picture you'll see now on the screen of my side yard. And this is a, this is a, a 60 foot pin oak, 30 years old. And it is growing about three to five feet off of my foundation wall. And, 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 and so I want us to take this as a warning. Do not underestimate the power of a seed. Why would someone plant a tree three feet off a wall? And the answer is they wouldn't. See, by the time I moved there, the previous owners had left this seed, this side, of, this side yard, so completely unattended, so overgrown, that what began as a single acorn, probably buried by an enterprising squirrel, had grown so big that it had the power to crack my 12-foot thick concrete foundation so that every time it rains, water comes in. And that happens. Don't underestimate the power in a seed. And if that doesn't convince you how powerful a seed is, then look at this picture. I want to introduce you in this picture is... Adam, Jonah, Uriel, Boaz, Judith, and Hannah. Not the biblical characters, of course. Not a veggie tale, but these are plants, of course. Mediterranean date palms, to be exact. Fairly ordinary, I think, looking until you realize who these plants are. <laughs> See, they're named after, after biblical characters because that's how old their seeds are. They're ancient. These plants grew up from unplanted seeds found in archaeological ruins dating back to the time of Jesus. See, archaeologists found, archaeologists as they're digging, they found these ancient ungerminated seeds as they excavated this site in Israel, these 2,000-year-old ruins. And as they, they dug them, they came across these ancient seeds. And, and one lady on the team just decided, well, what, I wonder what would happen if I planted them. No special treatment. She just put them in dirt and watered them. And suddenly, here you have six new date palms come to life that are technically 2,000 years old. It's, it's incredible. You think that you look good for your age. Look at these plants. Think about the kind of endurance and power that is latent within a, a single seed. Seeds are powerful. The life is in the seed. Why aren't we more impressed and awed by seeds? Don't underestimate the power of a seed in your life. Now, don't just take my word for it, of course. Listen to Jesus, and this is our text today. It's, it's, it's a verse, really, but I think it's a verse that bears our, our full attention. 
And I want you to listen to Jesus. He spent a lot of time trying to communicate to his disciples just how differently he operates than the world does. How different his kingdom was. And because of that, that they were perfectly predisposed or, or, or set up to miss his purpose. Because they're so used to the, the speed and the pace and the size and the hurry of the world. When Jesus comes along slowly, small, simple, they're, they're, they're set up just to absolutely miss him, to underestimate him, to miss his purpose. To, and we, we see it happening, to be confused by the things he's saying, his words, and, and even ultimately to end up denying his ways, to disagree, to not be obedient, to not be faithful. And as he communicates to them in stories and in parables and in teaching, what category or analogy do you think he found or turn to most frequently to explain the shocking difference between his kingdom that was coming in the midst of the old and their expectations that were formed by the world that they lived in. Well, he chooses the framework of agriculture. He speaks about vineyards, soil, over and over again, fields, workers in the harvest, and of course, the one recurring theme is the, is the theme of seeds. Specifically in Luke 13, 18, he, he asked this question, and we'll come back to this more next week. He says, what is the kingdom of God like? What picture do you have when you think about the kingdom of God? And that, I just want you to know, that matters what you, how you answer. What is the kingdom of God like? If you don't know, Jesus is trying to tell us you need a picture, a vision, an image of the kingdom. It's, it's important. He says, to what shall I compare it? He's saying, I know you need to understand this. This is going to be vital for you in order to, to fulfill and expect and anticipate and prepare for the kingdom. Is you need to understand what it's going to be like. Because it's not going to be like the way you thought. He says, so what am I going to compare it to that will help you understand? And he says this, it's like a seed. What kind of seed? Well, the smallest seed, I mean, I'm, we don't know particularly if mustard seeds were exactly the smallest, but that's the force of what he's saying is like a grain of a mustard seed, like the tiniest little seed, not just a big seed, but a small, small, small one that a man took and planted in his garden and waited and waited and waited and waited. And then he says, Jesus says that it grew and became a tree and the birds of the air, so big it became, the birds of the air made their nests in its branches. And when the disciples hear this, you can imagine, just like us, I don't think they were excited. I don't think they got pumped about waiting for a seed to grow. They said, Lord, I don't want a seed. I don't want a seed. When are you going to restore the kingdom, God? I, I want you to do it now. See, we've got to understand that in the same way that God's gift of, slow, of a slow seed is offensive and confusing to us when we want the, the, the end result like a tree or the fruit or its shade, so was Jesus' explanation of the kingdom difficult and disappointing and confusing to his disciples. They, they wanted something different, just the same way we do. Same disease. Same, same confusion between the world, the ways of the world, and the ways of the kingdom. So let's ask together then, if, if the kingdom though is like a seed, how can we prepare, how can we expect it, anticipate it? How can we imagine the kingdom? How is God's kingdom slow? And how can understanding that actually free us and encourage us? I mean, in some ways, of course, we, we want to clarify that God's kingdom is, is instantaneous. Not everything is slow. You know, if you repent, you're forgiven. Instantaneous. But I want us to, to, to focus on this because there's at least three important ways, and I know there's more, but three important ways we must consider the slowness of God for our lives. The slowness of God and his kingdom for our lives. And we'll see that actually some of them are overlapping a little bit. And the three things are, first, we must realize that the pace of God's work of growth or transformation in his kingdom, for anybody in his kingdom, is slow. It's like a seed. 
Second, we have to see that the, the God, the king or of the kingdom, is himself slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Slow to anger. So God is slow in some ways. And then thirdly, that this kingdom that, we're, that, that, is, that is growing up is slowly, it will slowly arrive. It's slow to be fully consummated. And sometimes that's difficult for us to understand why it doesn't come sooner or faster. And so I want us to just consider these three things to get a paradigm of the kingdom, to imagine it together so that we can expect it. So let's start with slow growth. Is anyone aware right now of a place, are you, as you're listening, you're thinking, processing, of a place in your life God has given you, <laughs> provided not the solution that you wanted or you asked for, but instead has given you a seed? You, anybody recognize? God didn't say nothing, but he did give you something slower and smaller and simpler than you thought. As a, a, you, you, you know, <laughs> he opened up a, a, a new way to the way to a new path, access to a new path to walk on, but you realize that there's still a journey you have to take, right? How, how many of you realize God forgives our sin and relieves us of the burden of guilt and shame that we, we carry, but the family situation that we're, we're really struggling with is still unresolved, right? There, it's a seed. It's not the full thing, it's the seed. He gives you a revelation from Scripture. This is... This is this is common. This happens every, almost every day. But you still have to put it into practice. If that's true, and you, can, you realize there's a place in your life that you have a seed, and, 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 you're, and you're kind of frustrated about it, let me encourage you in the Lord this morning. Wherever you have a seed, do not underestimate the power of that seed. Do not underestimate the, the, the grace of God that is actually at work within you. Do not, do not despise the day of slow and small beginnings because that which has been given is potent, full of life. It is not easily destroyed. God is faithful to his promises. It is the answer you need. It is the wisdom of God that lies probably beyond your understanding. So if you don't understand the seed, that doesn't matter. It's still faithful. It actually, will, it actually might surprise you what it does. All you need to do is take it and plant it in your life. Nurture it. Delight in it. See, it's funny. I, I talk to people who really love to garden. Not people who love to eat, but people who love to garden. I love to eat the produce. I don't have the patience for the garden. But people who love the garden, they celebrate it. They love to go in their garden and they love to watch their, their plants in every stage of, of their existence. Oh, it's so, it's precious. And they tend it and they water it. And they come back the next day and they delight in it because it's grown a new, a new branch or it's, it's starting to produce a new flower. And they delight in it. And this is what we're called to do, is in every step, delight in the word of the Lord, even as it grows. Trust in it. Wait for it. Invest in it. Lean upon it. Because God's word, we are promised, God's word, the seed of God's word does not return empty. It shall accomplish that which he intends. It shall succeed, Isaiah 55, it says. See, none of us at first, usually, this is at first, so there's hope, usually embrace the lengthy and slow process of healing, healing our wounds or our trauma. Or overcoming our fears. The lengthy, slow process of learning new things. The lengthy, lengthy and slow process of repentance, of changing our minds, of, of being transformed into God's image. We don't usually grab a hold of it and say yes to it because we're so programmed to think or to believe that there's another faster way that obviously won't take so long. There's some spiritual, we think, you know, we're, we're convinced or we're suspicious that there's some sort of spiritual tech stock boom that we could ride all the way to wealth without doing anything. Some lottery ticket miracle, some crypto investment hack, spiritual hack that will give us what we want at only the cost of pennies and in the blink of an eye. I mean, it's so tempting. 
It just, it's got, we see, you know, we, 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 we see other people and their stories and we think, yeah, they just, it just changed overnight for them. I want that. I'm claiming that. <laughs> but hear this in your moment of hurry, in your moment of, of franticness. Your rush, your shortcut will never get you where God wants to lead. Your anxious striving cannot accomplish what God intends to grow in you through love. Your frantic and fearful problem solving, your solutions will not endure in the day of trouble. Instead, hear the wisdom of this beautiful poem by this Ignatian priest, Teilhard de Chardin. He begins with this exhortation. He, his poem, which is longer, you can find it online. It's a beautiful poem. He opens up with this statement. He says, above all, trust in the slow work of God. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. He's saying, what can you trust in your life? Is the, the things that God has grown up like a seed in your heart. And so I want you to hear me, all of you spiritual rabbits, all of you impatient hares. God's kingdom, in God's kingdom, slow and steady wins the race. God, God, God loves and has many spiritual turtles. And, and he just, I just want to encourage you with that. This year, don't let impatience uproot the slow work of God's transformation in your life. God's doing things. He's working on you. He's, a, he's aligning things for you. And it's time to pay attention and to say yes to this process. Don't let slowness discourage you. No, don't let slowness discourage you. Don't let disappointment your disappointment rooted in your false expectations of speed cause you to give up so soon. Don't give up. If you plant the seed, it'll grow. If you plant God's seed, it'll grow. If you plant God's seed, it's going to reproduce in your life. If you plant God's seed, you already have God's provision. And not just one thing, but you have, in, the, in a seed is billions of seeds. Maybe some of you have crashed going too fast. You've, you, you, you got derailed by the spirit of this age, the hurry of this world. But the old proverb, this is not a biblical proverb, but it, it says the, the truth. It says, when is the best time to plant a tree? Well, the best time was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. The second best time is now. It's now is the time. And yet we struggle with things growing slowly within us, within our our team, our church, in our family, in our evangelism, in our, our witness, our, our, our mission. We struggle with things. We don't have patience for things that grow slowly. And this is because we're deceived. We're deceived into thinking that God is just like this world. That God is under some compulsion or speed. <laughs> that God is addicted to speed. We, we're, we believe somehow that God is demanding, most of all. You know, God's not gracious, gracious, compassionate. No, 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 God is demanding, demanding, and a little bit gracious. We think God's after quick results. We, we, we picture, we imagine the kingdom as God trying to push forward and all these people holding him back, and he's just frustrated about it. We imagine that God is these deadlines over our lives, holding them, looming over our heads, disappointed but let me ask you how fast is God's kingdom Jesus says it over and over again example after example it grows at the speed of a seed so relax you can relax and a seed will grow the seed will grow but not through your tenuous effort it won't grow you know, a, a, a watch pot doesn't boil. That's the phrase, right? It doesn't grow through our tenuous effort, not because of our expectations that we hold for this plant. You know, you will grow. Rather, seeds grow, we know, by equal parts, attentiveness and patient waiting. Attentiveness 
and patient waiting. Attentiveness to tend to the, what God is causing to grow as a gardener, right? Simple disciplines of pruning and water and light. But also this heart posture of patient and expectant waiting. See, patient trust, when I say those words, patient and expectant waiting, trusting in the slow work of God, that isn't meant somehow to be some sort of sentence or to a season of being burdened or disappointed or frustrated. It's meant to be a season of joy. It's meant to be a delight as you, as you watch the plant grow, where you watch and you celebrate, oh, God, you have, you have been doing a slow work in me, but I am changing. Where we can stand and say, I'm not worried about the process because I realize I can't grow anything in my life. I must tend simply to what God is growing. I can't make a seed grow any more than I can multiply bread or heal a disease. This is God's work. But God will complete what he started in my life as I say yes to him. God will complete it. God will complete what he began in your marriage. God will complete what he began in your community or at your work, in your relationships. God will do it. God will do it with your kids. This is true in our spiritual growth, our maturity. It's also true of our evangelism or our witness. True of our work in discipling others. It's not fast, it's slow. It's painstaking sometimes. It, it's, it, it looks like it's, it's you know, if we, we, we don't want to grow weeds, but, you know, we, we kind of like their speed. It's true of Christian community. You can't spring a church up overnight. It's got to grow up like a seed. And it will grow, and God will be faithful. They grow slowly to, things grow in the kingdom slowly to our anxious eyes. And yet, we don't need to be worried. The seed teaches us something. That it is only God who can make things grow. So praise God for that. And this ties right into this understanding of, of if you understand a seed, you can delight in the heart of God. If you understand a seed, you can delight in the heart of God because Exodus 34 has this line about God repeated over and over again then later in Scripture. You can search this in your, in your, in your Bible app. Just punch this in slow. And look how many times this verse comes up and is, is quoted. And it's people declaring who God is as in they're saying don't miss this. And this is what they say about God and what God says about himself, that he is slow to anger. Slow to anger. It's a very interesting and very specific description of God. God's, you know, out of all the things God could have said about who he is, this had to be in there. He had to make sure this was a, this was a bullet point, a title that he wanted to be referred to or explained or expressed as. Someone who's slow to anger. Slow to anger, it says, but and or yet abounding in steadfast loving kindness. See, God contrasts those two things. He says love, kindness, faithfulness, compassion. This is all kind of what that word means, loving kindness. Or abounding in God, on tap, overflowing from God, close to us, or close to us to receive from God, easily to access. But he says, but his anger is far away. Not non-existent. His anger is not wishy-washy. His anger is not fickle. It's just not close. It's not as easily kindled. It's not volatile. It's not quick-tempered. And that's, that's great news. That's the best news. You, who's thankful that the God of the universe, the king of all kings, isn't condescending? It turns out the God who made everything isn't condescending or harsh, but patient with us and slow in his anger. And he's patient so that he can be, he's patient so that he could be so brilliantly faithful to us. He loves to, to be faithful. He, he's patient with us because he's so brilliantly compassionate to us in our weakness and sin. It's the beauty of his mercy to be patient with you. It's the delight of his grace to be patient with you in where you are right now, as you are with all of the things that you have going on. God's patient, not angry. Slow to anger, but he's abounding. Oh, he's abounding 
with steadfast love right now. Loving kindness. Grace. Don't you see that your impatience with yourself or with the process is rooted in a lie that God went to specific lengths to address? Don't miss this. He knew how, that, how, how prone we were to default to fear and how that would affect our image of God. He, so he says, I'll say it clearly, I'm slow to anger my child. My child, I am son, daughter, I'm slow to anger. I'm not burning right now. I'm not disappointed. And it's exactly, it's exactly what Paul says about God's love as he beholds him in his glory. As he's, he's talking about you know, God who, who is love incarnate. And and Paul says this, he says, love, if you've seen love, if you've seen God, you know that he is patient, that love is kind. God is patient. Oh, he's he's kind. He's kind. He's gentle and lowly in heart. In 2 Peter, this very thing is expressed when it speaks about God's timing for both his work in us and, and also broadly speaking for the kingdom coming in this world. And this is where we'll see that overlap I was talking about of the the slowness of God's coming kingdom. Why doesn't God, you know, we might ask, why doesn't God just come back and finish this? Why doesn't he resolve all of this stuff? Why why is it taking so long? Why is God delaying his return? Why this, this gap? And Peter tells us the answer. And it's the answer not just to the kingdom coming, but also to God's work in your life. So hear it. He says, but do not overlook this fact. Do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and as a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So don't you see that God only seems slow to us? He only seems slow to us because he's still working out ways to be even more merciful and good to us. That's why it's taking so long is because you haven't opened up enough. God wants to pour out more. He just, he's not satisfied with your life. He has so much more for us. He, he, he's here to express his kindness and abundance in even greater ways through your life and story. And God is only delaying his final arrival, we find, for the sake of more people hearing the good news. The only delay is because of mercy, because he's slow to anger, because he wants to work out more. He wants to bless us. He wants us to thrive. He wants our lives to be seated in this world and to produce fruit. Oh, man. And and it takes us full circle because having explained God's slowness and having encouraged the people then to to, to be attentive, diligent, and to be patient, those are quotations right from, you should read 2 Peter 3. What analogy do you think Peter closes his epistle talking about? What, what, What picture does he want to leave with them to say, now then, if God is slow, it's just because of mercy. What does he want to tell them? What is his command to them? He says, Let me tell you about a seed. He says this, You therefore, beloved, take care that you do not lose your stability. Don't get dug up, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow. Patiently, attentively, let the seed of God grow in your life. So this morning, it's my prayer that you would receive this word This word as a seed, as a gift from God into your hearts. Maybe it's a relief and a rest to say, you know what? You can slow down this morning. That that word slow, spoken not by my lips, but by the voice of the Spirit, might be as an antidote for all of your anxious hurrying. For all of those seemingly barren places of failure where you're looking at the ground and you don't see anything popping up. Or for all those places of frustration where you're still waiting. Slow. Slow. God's faithful. Remember the power is not in you. It's in the seed. 
And God is the one who makes it grow. There, there are hundreds of seeds that you don't even realize God has planted in your life. Seeds of blessing. Maybe they were planted years ago. I don't know. Seeds of grace. Seeds that as you tend them, as you're faithful to God, as you're obedient to God, will grow up and bear fruit and bring shelter to others and be a, be a home. This is what the birds resting in the, tr- in, in the, mustard, in the mustard tree, <laughs> the mustard plant, They make nests in it because that place is a place of home, of welcome for them. Your life is meant to be that. Tend those seeds in your life. Nurture them. Delight in them. God will do the work. And God will bless you. Even more, know this. Your life is a seed wherever you are on on the macro level. Your family is a seed. Know that you were made to be planted in places, in cities, in neighborhoods, in in relationships, in different families, in in a company, in a business to grow. Maybe it feels like you're growing in obscurity. Maybe your growth has been despised or underestimated. Maybe you've been frustrated by it. But know this, what God begins, he finishes. The seed of the kingdom, know this, is imperishable, eternal, and with that end. And so I want to bless you this morning to receive that. So let me pray for you. Lord, thank you, God, for all of the many seeds in our lives, all the seeds of your word, your promises, your grace, your life in the seed. And so, Lord, we receive that, Lord, and we just say, Lord, let let our lives grow and thrive. Let us be attentive and patient, joyful and delighting in what you've done, Lord, not discouraged. And I pray you'd let hope arise. You'd let, you Lord, pour out grace that there'd be water that rains down from heaven, Lord, and causes these things to grow. And I pray, Lord, that you would relieve us from our hurry and let us rest in expectation. Bless your people, God. In your mighty name, Jesus, amen.